with God. Here's your host, Ken Gurley. Hey, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I am still trying to get used to that intro. It's like, who is that guy introducing me? Wow, he's got a great voice. I wish I had that voice. I welcome each of you today. Welcome to all of you. Oh, this is day three, day three of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And as you join in with us today, I just, I want to call attention to the book on prayer. And if you've not yet done the 21 days in the book on prayer, you need to avail yourself of this. We are running a discount. We want everybody to jump in on this. You can find it thebookonprayer.com. I don't know how it works, but I'm told there's a discount on there for the print version. Or you can just go to amazon.com and get the Kindle version and be a part of this. So thank you. Thank you for making the time to join in this group, in this very special group. We are living in uncertain seasons, but we have a certain God. Wow, that's what we're emphasizing in this 21 days of prayer and fasting. We are emphasizing the greatness of our God, and that God is the one we can look to and turn to at this time. So Amy, Becky, Sarah, Patty, Donna, Grady, thank you for joining us. Um, this is on Facebook Live, and starting this week, we're doing it on YouTube Live as well. We saw several visitors there yesterday, podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify. Yeah, and no, I'm not speaking in an unknown tongue there, but really I am. I have no idea what I just said, but I'm told to say that as well as to like the page, follow the page, and share the page. We're trying to get the word out. The word out is this. There is a group of believers that are resisting the darkness, and we are believing for a brand new day to dawn. We are believing for nothing short of the greatest awakening this world has ever seen. We're, we're praying, we're fasting. Find a way to fast. It punctuates our prayer, puts an exclamation point on our prayer. Share your prayer requests out to the side as you do and circle in. Let people know you care and that you're praying with them and for them. Leave a victory report. Leave an answered prayer. And we are seeing those. Share this with someone else. And let's build a community of faith, a community of light on the edge of night facing this. There's been many times our nation have gone through times of night. May 24, 1774 was just such a time. Thomas Jefferson drafted a resolution for a season of prayer and fasting. The British had blockaded Boston Harbor. In response to that, George Washington, a few days later, on June 1 of that year, he said, I went to church. He wrote this in his diary. I went to church and I fasted all day today. In times of great stress, our nation has traditionally turned to God. We've not turned to burning Bibles. We've not turned to burning churches. We've not turned to toppling crosses. We've not turned to anarchy. Rather, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We look to the God who is all sufficient. We look to the God who is more than capable, the one who can and will supply our every need. Paul said, I don't know about your God, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Second Corinthians 9, Paul said it like this in verse 8. God has given us all sufficiency. In verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 9, he has enriched us in everything with all bountifulness. In a pandemic world, in a world where things are scarce and where hope and confidence grows ever more scarce, we better know where our help comes from, that our help comes from the one who is the comparative and superlative the one who is better and best, the one who is more and most, the one who is greater and greatest, the one who has 
all sufficiency, the one who can provide for every need that we are going to encounter even in this day that we're living in. That's why today I want to talk to you about the subject. You may have thought I misspelled some words here. I want to talk to you about a subject, can and able. I did not say Cain and Abel. I said can and Abel. We need to get these words back in our vocabulary. He's that God can do all things. And he's more than able to provide our every need. The Bible says he is able to keep you from falling. We're serving the God who can and we're serving the God who is able. Would you allow me to do a series of if-then questions with you? Ready? First question. If a man were able to lift a horse, is the same man able to lift a feather? Just answer out to the side. Here, here's the second question. Uh, why don't we do a thumbs up, thumbs down? If a man were able to lift a horse, then is that same man able to lift a feather? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Second question, if a student was able to ace an advanced college calculus exam, do you think that same student could count to 10? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Third question, if a cow could jump over moon, the moon, do you think that same cow could jump over a fence? How are we doing out there? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Fourth question, if Shakespeare... William Shakespeare, the master of the English language, could compose timeless sonnets, plays, and writings. Do you think he knew his ABCs? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Fifth question. If a brain surgeon is capable of performing the most intricate surgeries touching the consciousness of mankind, do you think that brain surgeon could put a Band-Aid on a child's bobo? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Silly, you're, you're saying... Pastor, you're being silly. Yeah, you know, what we've just done with these five questions is to examine an age-old logical rhetorical device called a fortiori. It's a Latin phrase meaning from the stronger or even more so or with stronger reason. That if something greater is true, then something lesser is even more true, truer. If someone can do the greater, then with stronger reason, we believe that they can do the lesser. Are you with me right now? Here we go. So what that means is that a brain surgeon can indeed put a Band-Aid on a child. That Shakespeare was more than able to recite his ABCs. That a moon-jumping cow could easily clear a fence. And that a math genius could count to, Einstein could count to 10. And a weightlifter could lift a feather. What does that have to do with the Bible? What does that have to do with God? What does that have to do with morning devotion? What does that have to do with living in a pandemic world? Because that reasoning is found in the New Testament. The entire book of Hebrews is based on that very argument. In Matthew, the gospel to the Jews, Jesus used that same argument on the Sermon on the Mount. And he said it like this. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him how much more he can, he is able. We need to unlock our minds to the possibilities of God, that your prayers, my prayers, when we gather together, God is more than able to provide our every need. Do you know how Americans view God? Ted Olson and Go Figure Christianity Today article said 29% of Americans view him as a friend. Only 18% of Americans view him as, as king. And that's pretty much our problem in a nutshell, is that we Americans see God more as buddy-buddy than we do king of kings and lord of lords. That we are in the process of minimizing the majestic. We make God far smaller than what he is. Uh, he's not just a genius mathematician. He's, he's not the word made flesh in our mind. He's not the defier of gravity to Americans. He's not the great 
physician to Americans. Uh, he does not uphold the world by his power to most Americans. He's just a buddy, buddy. He's just a friend. He's my pal. Me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Leonard Ravenhill, who wrote Why Revival Terries, was in a European village taking a tour, and someone asked, was any, were any great men born in this village? And the tour guide said, no, just babies. Great men are never born, just babies. I've always found it curious that what great men are known for and remembered for, like Phillips Brook, who was perhaps the greatest preacher of his time in New England. The Phillips Brooks lectures still go on at Yale every year. He was a, he, he was a brilliant man, authors of some of the greatest volumes that have ever been penned that I have in my library. But Phillips Brooks was remembered for a little song he wrote while visiting the Holy Land in Christmas. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Yeah, that's what he's known for. Another man in that category is J.B. Phillips. He was a scholar who translated the New Testament, the Phillips translation. It, it is an incredible translation of the New Testament worth study. Yet he remembered more, he's remembered more for a little book that he wrote that described how people view our great God. He said Americans view God as the resident policeman, as a parental hangover, as a grand old man, as Jesus meek and mild and lowly, as a baby in a manger, or as the pale, anemic, Galilean, and so forth. And the book, he was remembered, very small, is called Your God is Too Small. And folks, that's what we're suffering from today. Our God our God has shrunk in America. In our minds, he has shrunk. We have limited the Holy One of Israel. The psalmist noted that tendency in Psalm 50, 21. These things have you done. And I kept silent because you thought, here's God speaking, you thought, I was altogether like you. We make God into our own image. We put our own limitations on God. We try to reduce him down to our level. It's like taking the ocean and the seven seas uh, and putting it in a Dixie cup. We limit the mighty God and we minimize uh, the majestic God. Oh, can I get a witness to that? Cassie and Sissy and, and uh, Desiree and Daryl. We, we just limit God. God. We limit God. Uh, there ought to be something in us that just says in 2020, I'm telling you on the third day of 21 days of prayer and fasting, can we just let God be God? Can we just allow him to be the Lord God Almighty that rules and reigns uh, in the universe? Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. It's in Prince Caspian, Lewis's uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Lewis, uh, Lucy noticed something about the lion, Aslan. She said, Aslan, you're bigger than the last time I told, saw you. And Aslan, who's the Christ figure, the lion in Lewis's writings, uh, he, he said, Lucy, I'm not bigger. It's because you're older. And she said, it's not because you are bigger. He said, I'm not bigger. But every year you grow. Here we go. Every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Folks, we need to let God arise in the year of 2020 and find him bigger than the God of 2019. Let him arise and let our enemies be scattered. Don't minimize him. Let God be God. You say, I don't know how to let God be God. Well, let's look at the ways we minimize him and then do the exact opposite. You ready? One way we minimize him is worry. We think now, if you've been raised in the church, you know this. Oh, folks, oh, folks, you know this, you know this. We look at worry and we call worry spirituality. We call worry holiness. We think worriers are the most spiritual people in church. Ask a worrier something and they'll go, mm, I don't know about that. They'll shake their head and mm. We think that's spiritual. That is fear, that is not spiritual, that's not carnal, that's how you limit the Holy One of Israel. How many times do we go to the Lord in prayer with worry lines on our forehead? We come in with worry, we leave with worry. Worry does not empty tomorrow, 
of its sorrow. This is what Corey Ten Boom said. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Never be afraid. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Oh, he can. He is able. If I minimize God through my worry, then how do I maximize God? We give our worries to him. Faith pleases him. We cast all our cares on him. We release our unknown future into the hands of the known God. We let God be God. Here's another way we minimize God. Unbelief. Again, we are more at home with doubters than we are with believers. Now, I, we got some folks from Missouri. If you're from Missouri, go ahead and shout out what city you're from right now. Shout out and tell us. Uh, you know, Missouri, if you don't know this, uh, maybe maybe uh, we had a, a, the bishop from Northeast India watching yesterday, and uh, you, you may not know this about the United States. Missouri is a state. It's one of the 50 states of the United States, and they have a motto. They have a slogan in Missouri, show me. You got to show me. And, you know, but faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. One way we minimize God is through our unbelief, through our show me, show me. I've got, you, I've got to see it to believe it. Where faith says, I believe it, and then I will. Oh, can I get a witness to that? That is just good morning devotion stuff right there. We, we, we need a Doubters Anonymous uh, some, what, somebody needs to start another devotion called Doubters Anonymous, a self-help group that gets together and, and just goes ahead and gets it out in the open. They don't believe God cares. They don't believe God heals. They don't believe God hears. They don't believe God's going to make a way. We need a Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief spirit. Confess that unbelief. Then let God be God and let him rise up in your life. Let me give you one more way we minimize God. We do it through guilt. Two phenomena I've noticed in pastoring. Some people are very hard on themselves. They got this little judgy voice going along all the time. They are what the Bible calls, they are guilty of having a weak conscience and they feel convicted about anything and everything. And it's hard for them to believe that God can and will forgive because they refuse to forgive themselves and they minimize God. Can I reason with you here? Here, let's do a little a fortiori. If God forgave Paul, who was the chief of sinners, then how much more can he forgive you? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the right. Here's the second phenomena I've noticed pastoring. We have the inability to forgive others. Didn't Jesus talk about that with the parable on the unjust servant? We've been servant, we've been forgiven so much. How much more? How much more should we be can and should we can? and be able to forgive those who wrong us. We let God be God when we let him be the judge and we give him vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Vengeance is a double-edged sword with a missing handle. You're going to grasp it. It's going to cut you. Vengeance is a certain season in hell. You don't need to live there. Let God be God and let God judge the matter and you rejoice. Uh, only believe. Uh, I was telling the story of Jairus yesterday and I just segued into the woman with an issue of blood and I sort of left old Jairus hanging. Let, let's, let's hit this proud, grown man who collapsed at the feet of Jesus because his little daughter, his little girl was at death's door and he begs Jesus, come lay hands on her and heal her. And Jesus lifts Jairus to his feet and journeys with him to his house. But at the same time, that woman with an issue of blood comes in. You remember what I said yesterday? Jesus said, daughter, thy faith has made you whole. And don't you know Jairus saying, that's what I want him to say, my girl. That's what I want him to say to my girl. But the Bible says at that exact moment, while he was still speaking, messengers from the house of Jairus arrived and said, your daughter is dead, Mark 5, 35. Jesus overheard the negative report and looked at Jairus and said, do not be afraid, only believe, only believe. Believe what? That if God could heal a woman who had been sick for 12 years, then how much more could he heal your little girl that's been sick for 12 hours? That if he can do the greater, oh, he can do the lesser. He is able to do the lesser. Believe. Come on. 
Come on, 21st century, 2020 believers, believe the best is still yet to come. Believe the best is still yet to come to come, that God has got something for us in this year, that there is something up his sleeve, that the last is going to be greater than the first, and that God is going to do something. You may have heard the most negative report in your life in the last 12 hours, but if God can, and if God will, and if he is able to resolve a 12-year-old problem, he can resolve a 12-hour problem. He knows how, he can, and he is able. I love that verse. I'm going to come back to it. Let me, in closing here, Matthew 7, 11. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father who's in heaven give good things? If you and I enjoy giving gifts, if you and I enjoy watching people be blessed, if you and I enjoy the next generation growing, learning, and becoming then how much more, a fortiori, how much more does God want to do good things for his children? God can do it. God is able to do it. And that's the can and the able we need to get in our minds during day three of this season of prayer and fasting. Would you take this take this thought into your prayer lines? Erase the worry lines. Yeah, you need a spiritual Botox. I didn't say go get Botox. I said you need a spiritual. Get rid of those worry lines and go in faith before God today and watch God do the miraculous in your life. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for sharing this with others. Loop around, pray one for another, and God bless you today. Amen. Thank you for listening to Morning Devotion with Ken Gurley. Join us next time for another inspiring devotion. To support this ministry, please visit firstchurch.com forward slash give.